All right, hello, and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine, and Pipeliner CRM, joining you as usual from San Diego. And today I'm delighted to be joined by Michelle Vazana, who is in Florida. How are you doing, Michelle? I'm doing great, John. Thanks so much. How are you? Yeah, and Michelle is the founder and CEO of Vantage Point Performance, uh, the for, at the forefront of global sales effectiveness, innovating sales management research, and evidence-based best practice for top performers. Uh, co-author of three books, and one which is coming in 2000, uh, 2023, Sales, The Sales Agility Code. And you can give the, the, the subtitle of that is? Yes, Deploy Situational Fluency to Win More Sales. Absolutely. And and just to, to be clear, as we go this interview, uh, Michelle and Vantage Point Performance, everything you do is is based on research. You do a lot of, lot of research and all of your work is based on research. Yes. Um, and that's really one of our guiding principles, John. I mean, a, there's a lot of sales training companies that have smart people that have had really interesting experiences and they turn those experiences into intellectual property and training programs. And, and we do it just the other way around. We go out and mm-hmm. we extensively study high performers. We figure out what they do, which is often counterintuitive. Uh, mm-hmm. And we use that information to then build frameworks and training. So Fantastic. And, and, what, and what we're going to talk about today is how to change Salesforce behavior while avoiding common pitfalls. So um, let's get straight into it, Michelle. Like behavior change, right? <laughs> That's a hard thing to do, right? Yes. It's a very difficult thing. It's, it's hard to change our own behavior, much less the behavior of other people, right? Exactly. And so when we think about behavior change, you know, one of the biggest mistakes organizations make is they assume that their sales management layer is going to embrace and drive adoption of everything that kind of flows through that level, that layer. And, uh, and that couldn't be farther from the truth, right? Mm-hmm. You have to equip sales managers differently to get them to, to drive change. And you have to actually have sales leaders behave differently toward their sales managers to drive change at the salesperson level. So there's this sort of multiplying effect, if you will, of either getting it right or getting it wrong. Mm-hmm. And and uh, and as we know, I mean, with sales management, I mean, a lot of the times, you know, it's sales leaders are people who were great salespeople and they, you know, promoted or some would say demoted into the sales leadership job, um, but without ever really getting proper training or or understanding of what to do. So they tend to do that. That tends to be the model. Like, like, just do what I do. And and that obviously doesn't work. So preparing sales, I've always said that sales sales management is the greatest like revenue multiplier, if you can get that right. That's right. That's right. Uh, It is. And what you said, John, is, is so accurate that most sales managers were very highly performing salespeople. You put them in a sales manager role. Um, You don't teach them how to do that role or how it's different than being a salesperson. Um, And so they try to do what they've always done, but, you know, 10 times more of it because now they Mm -hmm. have 10 people they're responsible for. And what happens when you don't properly equip them is it's kind of a double hit. Number one, you've lost a really good individual contributor, right? One of your top performers. And now you've got that top performer in in a role they're not prepared for negatively impacting an entire team. So that the way that managers equipped can either really um, leverage their efforts on that team to drive a much higher number of, or percentage of sellers at quota, or that manager can really impede the progress of that team really without realizing it until mm-hmm. it's too late. Yeah. So, so when you enge- when you engage with organizations, like, t- just tell me the process. Do you start with the sales management, or do you do the sale? Do you do them both together, or how how do you approach it, and how do you avoid, um, you know, how do you avoid the the pitfalls that may come from once you engage? You know, maybe there's resistance, all of this kind of the the stuff that we're all used to. Yeah, yeah. So we always feel it's best to start with leaders because mm-hmm. leaders, you know, drive everything. Um, if you want to change a salesperson's behavior, you have to change the behavior of their leader. If you want to change a sales manager's behavior, you have to change the behavior of their leader. So when we typically engage, whether it's sales manager training or salesperson training, because now we do both, um, the sales managers are always first. So if we mm-hmm. if we deploy, um, say, situational sales agility in the sales agility code with a sales force, the managers either go through it first or they go through it with their people. But there's always some sort of 
alignment discussion or briefing discussion with the sales management team prior to that training, and then they attend the training. So it's never a surprise. They get a very thorough understanding of their role, what's going to be required of them to actually drive this change. So it's um, they're, they're a critical enabler to adoption. So they have to be prepared and, and quite frankly, coddled a little bit <laughs> in no, the process to give them what they need not only from a motivational perspective, but from an educational perspective. They need to know, what do you expect of me? What's that gonna mean for the way I do my job? Um, and when we engage, especially when we engage with sales managers, um, it's the same philosophy with salespeople, but when mm. we approach an organization and we approach individuals in the sales force, we typically don't have as much resistance as a lot of sales training or companies or sales training programs have. And the reason is because we go out and study high performers and we do ongoing studies of high performers. So when yeah. we develop that into frameworks and training, it, it feels very natural. It feels very authentic. And salespeople say things to us like, well, wow, this is what I've been doing, but I couldn't explain it. Mm -hmm. um, and sales managers say things like, wow, this is the first training I've had that didn't make my job harder. You're actually making my job simpler. And we call that approach to simplicity the minimal effective dose. So we want right. to distill the size of the change down to a sort of elemental parts and eliminate what's unnecessary and only drive those things that have the greatest um, possibility of driving the outcomes that the client's looking for. Did I answer your question? Yeah, yeah no, ab absolutely. So what are some of the, uh, say, behaviors with, with sales managers that you need to change? Because, uh, I mean... You know, with a lot of sales managers, particularly if they've been top performers, you know, they kind of turn into super closers. Uh, you know, yes. I used to say they, you know, parachute in at the end and, yes. and sort of elbow the rep aside and close for them and then wonder why is the rep not happy about this? Like, right. look what I've done. Yeah. So there's a lot of things that, that the top performing sales managers do that are counterintuitive. So as a sales manager, it seems very logical to parachute in at the end and win the deal. What doesn't seem logical is getting heavily involved in the early stages of that deal with the seller in order to help qualify and shape that deal. That doesn't feel satisfying. It's not as exciting. It's not as fun. It's just highly effective. So when we think about the changes to sales manager behavior, there's really two primary changes and then some ancillary add-ons. One of the primary changes is when those managers get involved in the deal. And so they're going to get involved late stage. You don't have to ask them to do that. But getting them involved early stage requires a commitment and it requires deliberate action on their part. But it has a dramatic impact because what happens when managers get involved earlier in the deals and helping coach the qualification of deals, you have a healthier pipeline with more winnable deals that are shaped in ways that help you really differentiate competitively, even a better chance of winning them. And so what we do is we just reorient some of that activity and effort that the sales manager is expending and, and reallocate some of that from late stage to early stage. And just that one switch has dramatic effects. For example, when we work with GE, their sales managers have been trained on coaching for like five years, but they weren't mm -hmm. coaching and their pipelines were unhealthy and their close rates sucked, right? They were like 25% of forecasted revenue for this particular division. All we did was go in and establish some management discipline and rigor around not only coaching, but coaching early stage and what deal qualification should look like, what are the criteria they should be considering, what kind of conversation should they be having. And within at the 18 month point, their close rates of forecasted revenue, just by making a change in how I'm allocating some of the effort I'm already expending, those close rates more than double to 54% of forecasted revenue. Wow. So it's this shift from late stage to early stage. The yeah. other thing, that is a really big shift. Let me, yeah, let me just come back. Let me just uh, yeah. interject on that point because I think it's a it's a really critical it's a really critical point. And I bet you, when you do this work, then here's the thing that I always found is uh, the you have to make sure that upper management are on board and understand why this is happening because it will often it will often result in a reduction of your pipeline, but in a good way. In a yes. good way, because I would say like the feel good funnel, like load everything up into stage yeah. one and say yeah. things may be bad right now, but in six months time, I'm going to make a fortune. And then in yeah. six months time, you go, oh, sorry, it all moved out again. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Um, so you're, you're absolutely right about it for management. And the example that I just gave you with GE, 
Um, we realized very quickly in our work with them that they were forecasting more often than was needed. So they were doing weekly forecasts for relatively long cycle deals. Mm -hmm. And we thought one way to, you know, to really reallocate some of that time is to not have to forecast every week. Can we forecast every two weeks? Even that was probably more often than they needed. And the uh, senior management said, absolutely not. That is not going to happen. It's not an option. You know, you got to give us another plan. And so we kept the forecasting weekly because we couldn't change that. But what we changed is the sales managers were having these meetings with their reps every week, one hour a week with each rep to basically scrub the pipeline, which is a late stage activity. We took two of those four meetings and reallocated those to early stage deal qualification to really dig into a few early stage deals. So they kept the forecasting the way it was, but expended less management effort developing the forecast. It reallocated some of that effort toward the early stages. So we knew that we couldn't change certain things that were sacrosanct, right? Right. (laughs) They were not going to be changed. But then we had to work around that and within those parameters in order to realistically help adjust sales manager effort. Yeah. And uh, and what, what was the other one you were going to mention about something that's kind of uh, counterintuitive probably to, to sales managers? Yeah, so when we went into some of our research um, projects, we anticipated that the highest performing sales managers would actually coach more for more hours and coach more frequently. And that's exactly the opposite of what we found. We right. found that the most effective, successful sales managers that get higher percentages of their teams to quota, they coach less frequently but they coach fewer things, but for longer durations. So uh, say a low performing manager might coach their sellers every week for half an hour. And a high performing manager might coach one hour every two weeks and, or even 45 minutes every two weeks, but they would discuss fewer topics in more depth. So it wasn't the quantity of coaching. It was how they were coaching and what they were coaching, right? The more successful ones oriented toward early stage, they discuss fewer opportunities in more depth. The lower performers oriented toward late stage, discussing many opportunities at a very superficial level. So mm. that was another one that was kind of surprising. Yeah, and 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 on on that one, the, I think it's really interesting. Number one is nobody's nobody is a natural coach. Nobody's ever taught, uh, and and very few people are taught how to coach properly. And unfortunately, a lot of people take their 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 coaching they go okay what's my experience of coaching oh yeah it was that guy in high school shouting from the sideline right so basically i just i just my coaching is i i I, once a week i tell you what you should be doing and then you go off and do it right right um the other thing that we learned that was really kind of interesting is that this ad hoc coaching in the moment that managers love they really love that. They, you know, really get into that. It's like, oh, it's exciting. It's always different. It's useful, but it's not as high quality. So the managers that really perform well, they still do ad hoc coaching, but they also formalize the coaching that matters most. So they identify those activities that have an outsized impact on performance and they formalize coaching around those things. They schedule it. It's repeatable. It's predictable. It sets a cadence for the sales team or a rhythm. Um, And it's not like they are overly scheduling themselves. They just, they're very good at prioritization. And once they prioritize, they commit to coaching those things that matter. They don't try to coach everything. They only coach those things that have the biggest impact on the performance they're looking to move. And and you said something really important there, and it's, that's the commitment. Because the other thing that often happens with when 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 a company goes through a a performance improvement initiative is like, okay, they start off coaching, and I put I'm your sales manager, and I put a coaching uh, a coaching appointment on your calendar every week. I turn up for the first one, the second one, I go, oh, sorry, Michelle, I can't do it this week. Something come up, I'll do it next week. And before you know it, we're not really doing it, or we're doing it sporadically. And you are saying, well, if it's not important to you, then it's not important to me. That's right. That's right. Interestingly enough, John, to your point, when we did the research, um, we looked at some very granular details about coaching practices. And one of the details that we gathered was how often does your manager cancel or rescheduling or reschedule coaching conversations? And the lower performing managers had a much higher incidence of canceling and rescheduling. The higher performing managers had a much lower incidence of that. And their coaching was less frequent, but more consistent. Mm -hmm. So that's that whole idea of the minimum effective dose. If I only have to coach you, do opportunity coaching with you once a month for an hour, then I shouldn't do it every two weeks. 
If yeah. once every two weeks is sufficient, I shouldn't do it every week. And what I, what we find is that when manager coaching is not consistent or predictable, it's because they've designed a coaching rhythm or a coaching structure that doesn't allow for issues to arise. It doesn't allow for variety or flexibility. And so that's why we say, look, find the minimum effective rhythm that will work for you and your team around whatever topic it is that you're coaching, because then you can avoid all the rescheduling. You can set consistency, predictability, which drives higher motivation in your sellers and all of that stuff. Mm-hmm. And, and are you seeing, uh, you know, now that we're sort of in the post-COVID um, era, um, are you seeing any new or maybe, you know, more uh, more emphasis on, on different areas or challenges now that, you know, maybe a lot of people haven't gone back to face to face. Maybe it's still virtual. Maybe, you know, maybe it's a hybrid setup. It just seems that it's gotten a little bit more complex, maybe for, for sellers. So have you seen an impact of this? Complex because the selling is more virtual or complex? Yeah, because, because exactly. Yeah. I think that sellers were initially afraid of it. They didn't really understand it. Um, and, you know, change is hard. You know, so we're used to having that face to face time and now we have to accomplish many of the same things without being face to face. It causes us to panic. And I think what we don't realize is that there's so much similarity, whether you're selling in person or over Zoom or, you know, over Microsoft, whatever it is. Um, There are some there are some additional challenges, right? It's harder to read body language. You can't really look around their office and say, oh, what's that? Is that a picture of you going fishing, right? You can't do that kind of stuff, right? I mean, the, the, the well, you, you can try, but if it's a virtual background, it's going to make you look yeah, a bit silly. Right. And everybody has their virtual background. So it does take away some of the sort of tactical things that we used to enjoy to create rapport and things like that. But I'll tell you what I've seen, John, is it makes people more organized and more well-prepared. Because if you know you're going to be meeting with a larger group typically than you would if it was face-to-face because it's easier to pull more people in, right? And the topics are pretty much nailed down. So it, what I've seen is it's, it's driven a much higher level of formality and preparation required, which I think is a great thing. I think that's a mm-hmm. very positive outcome. And since we don't have to have all this time driving to and fro, right, we have more time to plan and strategize. So I think overall the impact, while initially scary, has been quite positive. Yeah. And and just an interesting point that you made there is, uh, you know, given the fact that a lot of this stuff is virtual, so it's very easy to bring other people in. I mean, that raises its own challenge then, doesn't it? Because you now have maybe more people involved in the buying decision. You've got to be, you've got to be very aware of what their different roles are. Again, um, that's something that I think... Uh, you know, still, I think some people get addicted to their one contact or their two contacts. But as you said, I mean, in this virtual world, you've got to really understand how everybody is impacting the sale. That's right. And, you know, there's a lot of research, not not our research, but Gartner and Forrester have been saying that buying teams in general are just getting larger and buyers are getting more and more risk averse, right? We used to have stalled deals primarily because they were not well qualified. And now we have stalled deals because people are afraid of making a bad decision. I mean, they, they're more afraid of making a bad decision than making no decision. And so their level of granularity at talking to references and understanding your deployment process and engagement process and looking for evidence. I mean, they're getting really demanding, which, which I can understand, right? Because their jobs are more high risk than they used to be, right? If something yeah, no. doesn't you know, boy, do I, have, I don't have egg on my face. I have omelet on my face, right? Yeah. So it's, it's a different world. Yeah, no, I, I agree. And I and I think that is um, probably your biggest competitor right now is, is the no decision, uh, you know, as opposed to another competitor. Because, yeah, it's it seems it seems the comfortable and easy decision to do nothing and maybe just ride things out. So that's putting, obviously, a lot more pressure on salespeople to, to be able to um, overcome that risk aversion. It's not only the risk aversion. Um, it's also created even bigger problems for companies that are innovative. Mm-hmm. So for example, it's kind of like, you know, you never get fired by, from choosing IBM, Yeah. but you might get fired for choosing the small innovative company out in the Silicon Valley that, you know, isn't big like that. Right. And yeah. I think that's also true in our industry. Right. Um, so what we have found, because we've always kind of been on the forefront of the research, we were the first ones that come out and say, the sales manager's the key, get that right. You get everything right. 
And then we were the first ones to, you know, in a, in a mainstream way, introduce sales agility into the sales training marketplace. And that's a new message, right? That's a new approach. And sometimes, especially for sales, ultimate, you know, CROs, sales leaders, you know, they want to go back to what they know, right? Yeah. They want to go like, well, I did this 20 years ago and it worked. So let's do that. Right. And so, although some of the newer findings might be really compelling, there's that risk reward piece. So what yeah. we're finding is not only do we have to get very strict on the evidence-based research, but we have to give examples of case studies and, and you know, success cases and that sort of thing. I mean, the level of risk aversion is high and particularly yeah. for companies who are on the sort of the, the front end of that innovation. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. And that, and that really underlines what you were saying earlier about that you have to be so much more better prepared. You have to have everything, all your ducks in a row and have all the research, understand who everybody is. So you got to do a lot more, a lot yes. more prep work and just, uh, and, and then you're probably putting yourself, yeah. And the nice thing is if you do that, you're probably putting yourself ahead of everybody else because they're not uh, doing quite the same. Um, well, listen, Michelle, this has been fantastic. All of Michelle's information will be below this video. But before we go, please do tell people a little bit more about you and Vantage Performance. So we uh, have been around for about 14 years and we've been in the sales training space that entire team, the entire time, um, focused on doing innovative research of high performing salespeople and sales managers. So when you see frameworks or training programs that come out of Vantage Point, you know they're evidence based, you know they're going to be relevant. Uh, and you know that they're recent, right? We continue to do research, update our research and revalidate our research. So we want to be known out there as the ones that, that take research seriously, value high performers, honor the experience that you bring to any of our engagements um, to help you drive even better performance. So yeah. thrilled Absolutely. to be talking about out there. Yeah, fantastic. And I'd encourage people to check it out. As I said, it's research based, which is it's which is important. So you're not just getting somebody like, hey, this is what I did. This is what you should do. You're getting research based. So I would go uh, encourage you to go check it out. As I said, all the links are below. So thanks again, Michelle. Thank you for watching and listening. I'll see you all again soon. Thanks so much. I appreciate it.